Yannick Sitter will become the best tennis player in the world. I also imagine that's what most of you guys are thinking at the moment, judging from the overwhelming demand for a Sinner video. So let's talk about Sinner, his strange trajectory to the top, the key elements of his game that make him so special, where he improved, the highlights of his 2023 season, and what to expect moving forward. As a child, Sinner was one of Italy's top junior skiers from 8 to 12 years old. By the age of 8, he had already won a national championship and was the second best skier for his age group nationwide at age 12. He also loved football, or soccer as us Americans call it, which meant that tennis was relegated to his third choice at the time. But at 13, Sinner finally decided to prioritize tennis after some pushing by his father. With little or no experience at the junior level and not even getting to feature in any junior Grand Slam tournaments, the odds were heavily stacked against him and he had to link up with legendary Italian coach Riccardo Piatti. You see, Sinner only played a few junior ITFs and wasn't even ranked highly enough to enter junior Grand Slams. Fortunately, he made quick inroads at the challenger level and was able to catch up with lots of hard work and determination. Go watch some of Carlos Alcaraz's highlights at 10, and you'll understand that getting into the sport late leaves you with some disadvantages, except if you're one of those few late bloomers like Stan the Man. But could it also be that Sinner's early focus on skiing and soccer may have paid unforeseen dividends to his later tennis career? I mean, those sports also require good coordination and leg strength, but who knows? So how did Sinner become the player that he is today? Sinner turned pro in 2018 at 16 years old and was ranked as low as 1,583 in March 2018. He quickly moved up 800 spots to 762 by the end of the year and won his first ATP Challenger title in February of the following year, despite no prior match wins at the Challenger level. Just three months later, he was in the top 300 and by August 2019, he was in the top 150. He then won the ATP Next Gen title in November, entering into the tournament as the lowest ranked player. He would enter into the top 80 at the end of the year. At this point, the predictions rolled in. Tennis legend John McEnroe called him one of the most talented kids he had seen in the last decade. Personally, I was on the center hype train myself. I thought that his raw talent matched up well enough against anyone in the next gen. 2020 came and Sinner bagged his first ATP title and became the youngest Italian tour level champion in the open era. He also broke into the top 40 that year and by 2021, Sinner was a top 10 player with four more ATP titles and a Masters 1000 final. Although Sinner made some progress in 2022, it didn't quite reflect in his results. Physical problems, not finding his best form when it mattered most, and even some doubts about his mentality started to creep in. Well, until this year. Sinner started the year ranked number 15, and his performances were decent. Although a red-hot Tsitsipas got him in five sets at the fourth round of the Australian Open, Sinner would win the next tournament he played, the Open Sud de France in Montpellier. He then reached the final at Rotterdam, where many beat him in three sets. After that, he reached the semifinals at Indian Wells, where Carlitos got the better of him, but Sinner returned the favor at the same stage in Miami. He stepped it up, putting on a show against Carlos in what was one of the matches of the year. I'm sure most of us still remember. Although Sinner lost to Mehdi in the final in straight sets, things were starting to look up at this point, and you could tell that it was only a matter of time before the big break came. Well, not after a disturbing loss to Daniel Altmaier at the second round of the French Open. Sinner lost in five sets after holding two match points in a game that lasted five hours and 26 minutes. Before then, he had reached the semifinals at Monte Carlo, which I think is one of the more difficult clay surfaces, so he wasn't exactly the worst player on clay, but poor performances and physical issues in Barcelona and Rome meant that he wasn't exactly in the best shape leading up to the French Open. After the clay season, Sinner's struggles continued as he retired against Sasha Bublik in the quarterfinals of Halle, but come Wimbledon, he was a much different player. He had his best performance in a Grand Slam tournament, reaching the semifinals, where Novak simply outclassed him. Shocker there. But there was just one problem. Sinner didn't face a top 75 player en route to his semifinal appearance, so many fans were still not convinced about his potential, which is kind of funny because Kasper Ruud and Taylor Fritz were in his quarter and it's not his fault that they lost to lower ranked players. Looking back at those people who wrote him off, I kind of feel bad for them. Following that, Sinner smashed a significant milestone, winning his first Masters 1000 trophy at the Canadian Open. Again, there were some side talks that he had a walkover and that the only seeded player he faced was Tommy Paul, who was the 12th seed. Sinner then had a hangover, losing in his first match in Cincinnati. He then lost to Alexander Zverev in the fourth round of the US Open. At this point, I feel like he was losing one too many five-setters. 
I mean, a five-set loss against Denis Shapovalov at the Australian Open in 2021, five-set loss to Nole at Wimbledon in 2022, and the same against Carlos Alcaraz at the US Open. The same thing repeated itself at the Australian Open, French Open, and now US Open. It was sickening, and personally, I felt like this guy deserved more. I'm sure he had similar ideas because we saw a different Sinner post-US Open. Sinner put on a show at the China Open in Beijing, demolishing Carlitos in the semis before breaking his duck against Medvedev in the final. Beating the top two seeds said something about his intentions for the rest of the year. Although Ben Shelton surprised us by beating Sinner in the round of 16 in Shanghai, the Italian was back with a response, beating Shelton at the very next tournament in Vienna. He then had to go through Lorenzo Sanego, Francis Tiafo, Andre Rublev, and the defending champion Medvedev again to win the title in Vienna. We all looked forward to Paris, but it was quite disappointing to see what happened. The organizers in Paris came under a lot of criticism for lining up so many matches on one court. With six matches scheduled every day on the center court, matches extended past midnight, and players complained of not having enough time to recover and prepare for their next match. Sinner had to withdraw due to fatigue and not wanting to risk his health with Turin in sight. There was literally a public outcry from coaches, players, and everyone when this happened. Any idea why the organizers decide to fit all the matches onto one court? My best guess is that it's simply what was best for the business. You see, tennis is a harsh business, but we're not going to talk about it here because I already made a really interesting video about it. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. By the way, many of you are subscribing to our newsletter where we cover the latest from around the ATP and WTA tours. It's the spot to get your news and not sound like a fool when that one tennis nut friend we all have asks your opinion on the latest 250 event quarterfinal. So if you haven't subscribed to the newsletter yet, click the link down below and we'll see you over there. The ATP finals came and Sinner had since qualified, being the fourth to do so for the event in Turin. But there was a funny stat which most people didn't know about. Sinner had a terrible record against everyone in his group. Love 3 against Nole, Love 2 against Runa, and 2-5 against Tsitsipas. That's a cumulative 2 and 10, but we all know these stats didn't paint the full picture. Guess who came out on top in the end? Sinner won all three matches in his group, beating Tsitsipas and earning his first wins over Djokovic and Runa. I particularly loved the fact that he went all out against Runa despite having already qualified. He then beat Medi for the third consecutive time in the semifinal, but just wasn't at his best in the final against Novak. Overall though, great performance in front of his home crowd. But there was a final act of the season where Sinner helped Italy win the Davis Cup for the first time in 47 years. He even saved three match points against the greatest. No one does that. It's only happened three times overall in his career and that was a long time ago. Sinner had now gotten two wins over Nole. I know the Davis Cup and a round robin match at the ATP Finals aren't comparable to Wimbledon or a Grand Slam, but come on guys, give him some credit. Let me show you what's changed about Sinner. Sinner's late season surge is no fluke. It's been a long time coming. The truth is that for every time a question was asked about Sinner, he has come back with a response. I, I always feel like that I have improved a lot throughout the whole year. First, his physicality was questioned. Although Sinner could annihilate balls with his racket in a manner that would have impressed Juan Martin Del Potro, he just didn't seem to have the it factor in other physical aspects of his game. His athleticism wasn't close to the likes of Alcaraz, he was dealing with a lot of minor injuries, cramps, and physical issues for someone his age, but what many didn't know was that this guy was a late bloomer physically and was still developing. Now it's pretty much clear that his physical development has hit remarkable heights, and that part of his game is no longer a worry. Sinner is in better shape and also has great lateral movement thanks to a dedicated training program. What do we have next? Sinner's mentality and nerve management in big moments was also questioned. He seemed to underperform in some of his biggest matches or against any top player that wasn't Carlos Alcaraz. He lost too many deciders and just wasn't consistent. But when you're a legend like Rafael Nadal, it's easy to recognize raw talent even when the results aren't exactly off the charts. Here's what Rafa thought about Sinner long before he became a top five player. He's a humble guy. He's a hard worker. I practiced with him the other day. He has a good character on court. He's positive. I see him having a great tennis career. He has everything to, to achieve a great tennis career. And all the thing that he needs to do, in my opinion, is have the right people around and work. 
I like the fact that Sinner maintains a laser-sharp focus during matches and isn't easily distracted. Even when things aren't going his way, you won't see him coming up with any excuses or juvenile antics. His self-discipline, maturity, and demeanor on and off the court is almost reminiscent of Roger Federer in some way. Another area that's seen massive improvements is Sinner's serve. He had to tinker with his service motion to find the right formula midway through the season, which is why he could win 79% of his first serves against the greatest returner in the history of the sport in their round-robin match at the ATP Finals. Sinner changed from a platform to a pinpoint stance. So rather than leaving his back foot at the starting position until takeoff, Sinner now moves it up alongside the front foot before driving off the ground. On top of that, he has modified his preparation technique and now adopts a more classical offside lift where he can achieve a more circular motion of the racket positioned in front of the shoulder line. This reduces the delay between ball placement and racket lift. Sinner is also willing to add in the slice once in a while too. Here's the difference between Sinner's first half of the season and the second half in terms of service statistics according to TDI Insights. His motion might not be 100% natural at the moment, but he's getting there and that's easy to see. Sinner is only behind Nole for percentage of second serve points won in the last 52 weeks. He is also well in the top 10 for highest percent of service games won in the last year. Another area Yannick Sinner has improved is his shot selection. He's also more comfortable transitioning forward. Technique-wise, I listed this improvement as number 4 because Sinner's technique has never really been in doubt. Despite his slight frame, Yannick Sinner's forehand remains one of the most destructive on the ATP Tour. Sinner has a long swing on his forehand, but maintains a low and compact backswing. This is why he can deal with fast-paced and low balls easily. Being able to handle pace means he gets to make better returns. A strong semi-western grip also allows him to get more topspin on the ball, while he hits with crushing power and accuracy, which he loves to do cross-court. It might be a little hard to notice all of these in real time, but definitely notice how he minimizes the amount of tilt on his elbow as he loads up the forehand while also flipping the tip of the racket head behind his elbow. This is what separates him from other players and when it comes to power. We already know Sinner's backhand is up there as one of the heaviest on tour. It has more topspin than almost every other player. Using good wrist movement and upper body rotation, he generates a lot of speed, spin, and depth. His ability to hit the ball deep makes him a nightmare to play against. Even while still developing his technique, Roger Federer admitted that Sinner's quality off both ground strokes was insane. He's almost got the same speed of uh, off shot on forehand, backhand, you know. Sinner has literally improved every aspect of his game. Even his drop shots, volleys, and net game are way better. His defensive skills might need a facelift, but you only have a chance of putting him on the back foot if he somehow doesn't manage to hit ripping ground strokes right through you. It's not even surprising that he leads the charts for percentage of second serve return points won, and is in the top three for percentage of return games won. By the way, we need to talk about some of the top players who have kinda underperformed by their standards last year. We already did one about Stefano Tsitsipas, which you guys absolutely loved, but do you care enough to see a video on Holger Runa, Kaspar Ruud, or Felix Auger Aliassim? Now that we've taken a look at how much his game has improved, let's take a look at his results that he's achieved so far. Sinner now has the most titles won by an Italian male. He's one of the few active players with 10 plus top 5 wins in a season. He won 4 titles this year became the youngest Italian man to ever win a Masters title, doing so at 22 years old. Sinner is number 4 in the world, the highest ranked Italian man of all time. He had 64 match wins all season, a personal record for him. 8 consecutive wins against top 10 players. Sinner's record against the top 10 in 2023 is 13-6. and 6. He entered the year at 9-21 and 21 against the top 10. Over $8.3 million in prize money over the course of the season. Yannick, feel free to share some of that over here. On a side note, shout out to the Karota boys because we just couldn't do a Sinner video without mentioning them. We all seem to forget that Sinner wasn't even a top 10 player last year. Wondering why he was nominated as the most improved player of the year? Of course, it would be a great injustice not to mention the tremendous amount of work that his coaches Darren Cahill and Simone Vagnozzi have put in, which is why they were also nominated for the Coach of the Year award. Many legends, fans, and even players like Mehdi believe that Sinner's time will come. If he plays like this, like he played last week, uh, all the time, he's going to have slams, number one. Uh, then it comes to how many weeks, how many slams and stuff like this. I almost forgot to mention that Sinner also had the edge in his biggest rivalries this year. 3-2 and two against Mehdi, 
2 and 1 against Carlos, and 2 and 2 against Novak, which literally means that no member of the top 3 had a winning record against our man Sinner. How about that for some stat? But there's just one thing. We must not fall into the trap of setting the Italian up by saying outrageous things like he's going to win three slams in 2024, or he's just going to annihilate everyone. I mean, he is still developing into the next phase, so maybe it's okay to pump the brakes a little. Do I think he's gotten to a point where week in, week out, he's a contender for the biggest titles? Absolutely. Is he worth the hype? Every bit of it. But I'm okay with just allowing him to enter into the next phase of his career without being over-demanding. FAA had a super strong US Open run last year, and he was nowhere to be found in 2023. It's unlikely that would happen to Sinner because he's a much more well-rounded player, but we still need to put things in perspective. On days when Sinner's topspin backhand isn't doing any damage, he should be able to do more problem solving, like switching to a slice, or simplifying mixing up the pace of his ball more often to draw out errors like his opponent Novak. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that he'll need even more options when things aren't going his way. He's already shown his ability to adapt several times, so it's not something I'm even bothered about. Sinner doesn't need to be as versatile or as flashy as Alcaraz to win slams, he just needs to do his thing. I still don't think he could push Djokovic into retirement like Adriano Panata says, but somehow if he manages to become Nole's biggest rival, then he's fully deserving of any praise he gets. Sometimes it's hard to talk about Sinner without mentioning Alcaraz. It's why we also made a new video on Carlos Alcaraz, putting his 2023 season into perspective. Check it out here.